Um, Luca, I just I have I have the final lines of. Um, I'll, I'll wait maybe just a second for people to move. Um, yeah, I have the final lines of, of the last film in my head, but I want to move to something else. I find that fascinating when the Westerner comes to India, he has everything but gives nothing, and the Indian has nothing but gives everything while we're seeing a cremation, um, a ritual cremation. Okay, but maybe I'll set that aside for a second. Um, we saw three incredibly different films. I mean, stylistically, um, I, I, I unfortunately didn't, do my homework. Are they in chronological order? Did we see them? No. Uh, the, the location scouting is the very first, 64. And then uh, 67 notes. And then uh, Wall of, Walls of Sana, 69, 68. So. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I just, maybe I'll just start with just one, one comment I, I mentioned to you already, um, particularly in the first film, um, the location shoot. Um, in Palestine, it's um, it's very difficult to hear, to listen to Pasolini describe um, the Arab people as animalistic, um, which for him means they're not going to get a role in his film. <laughs> um, but but um, but, and I think to um, to somehow square that with the um, the kind of post-colonial reading that you're offering us. Um, I, I mean, you, you, you mentioned, um, by referring to Cesare Casarino, the kind of, compli Pasolini is complicated. We can't just simply dismiss him as Orientalist. There's, he, he certainly is putting himself out there in his sort of self-presentation, particularly in that film, I think is quite exceptional and fascinating as well. Um, so there's an honesty an integrity in, 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 to some extent in, in what he's presenting us, but there's still something quite, dare I say, racist, orientalist, purely. Um, and, and I'm sort of interested in, in maybe trying to tease out some of, of the still das Revolution findet trotzdem statt of the kind of revolutionary potential that one, yeah. or rev post-colonial revolutionary potential that, 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 that you also emphasize despite your more sober yeah. perspective. Well, um, well. First of all, thank you for staying. It's a, it's a long night, <laughs> and these films are difficult films. I mean, they're not uh, easy, um, and as Mark said, they are very different stylistically. They all goes under this sort of general heading of nodes, but very mm -hmm. different. So. Uh, going back to your question, it's very easy to dismiss Pasolini on with our own contemporary sensibility and particularly nowadays. Um, funny enough, animalistic for Pasolini was a positive mm -hmm. comment. You know, these people are too good. I cannot use them. I need somebody who is being corrupted by Christianity. These, these people are too pure. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. this, if we want to do an authorial reading. But let's, let's go back to the general story here. Um, when, when it's easy to accuse Pasolini of Orientalism, the question is, where were the others? Where were the other filmmakers? Where were the other intellectuals? What was the engagement of the other intellectuals with the liberation struggle, with the third world, and so on and so forth? So what I'm saying is, it's very easy to, to accuse him nowadays and say, well, this is obviously an, just... And I'm not saying that it's not there. It's very present. So did you see in this very last film, there's a bizarre close-up of Indian prints... There's this constant going back to Indian prints. So Pasolini is fully aware of his, let's call it, wine, white man burden. He's fully aware that he's not going to India uh, without a baggage. He's going to India fully aware of the whole history of Orientalist representation. And these prints that he holds in his hands are somehow the proof of that. It's kind of, I'm fully aware that it's impossible to go there. And yet... I'm going to do it. I'm going to go there. I'm going to talk to the journalists, the communists, uh, and the people in the street, right? So it is this precisely this engagement, this direct engagement that uh, I found fascinating. And as I said, uh, he, it has been done. Pasolini has been accused of being an Orientalist. And also, uh, I'm sure next week, uh, Tom Wall will talk about this. 
there's an all erotic aspect of Pasolini's trip to the to Africa. That is to say, the fact that he uh, and his friends used to go there because it, it was it, they were more allowed as white rich men to find young boys to have sex with, right? So there is this comp- this all erotic aspect of Pasolini in Africa that I hope maybe Tom will address that I didn't just because of the fact that I had to. Uh, talk about one thing I can talk about everything that happened there so it's extremely and I'm not saying that this film for example it's very difficult to show these films to undergraduate American students <laughs> because it's it's unacceptable that uh, that I show a film about uh, about uh, um, Palestine where the Arabs are described as animalistic as it does in the sense that I would have to do so much preparation for it that it's kind of not worth the while um, <clears throat> but I think that here and particularly in a all year long address on on Pasolini then it's important to have this aspect of his uh, of his uh, um, intellectual formation also notice that in the wall of Sana's films he keeps on talking about how Yemen just re-enter history it's very clear that Pasolini has a very clear sort of Hegelian vision of history like a clear route right and these people have to jump on it so I'm not saying that uh, Pasolini all of a sudden became Edward Said and or Homi Baba 20 years before what I'm saying is that he is gone there while others weren't. And we can name, you know, we can think, think of Louis Mal in India, but not exactly at the same time. Renoir uh, in Renoir in India in, in the think, 50s, yeah. but it's a, you know, com- complicated yeah. Orientalist project mm-hmm. in many respects. More now in the South Seas. Yeah, more, more now in the South Seas. So in a way... Um, a good answer to, to this question is a film mm-hmm. called The Waiting for Pasolini. I don't know if you guys have seen it by a Moroccan filmmaker. Um, it's uh, I forgot his name right now. It's actually a very funny film. It's a, it's a story about a, group, a Moroccan village uh, which is waiting for a production company so, so, so that they can get a job. They're all unemployed and they're all waiting for a European company to come and shoot a film so that they can all be extras. And one of them says, I was an extra in a Pasolini's film. And so this the, the story goes but yeah maybe maybe just just to follow this up with one other thought and then i'd love to open it up for questions right away um we heard last week um in a um a talk from massimo Fusil, fusillo about medea and um how pasolini it seems that there's an interesting connection with some of what you talked about today how pasolini there doesn't give us the feminist medea um he doesn't give us in a sense a postmodern medea um, he rejects, let's say that, because he privileges the barbaric, and we get a truly barbaric Medea. Um, like, like every poet, uh, he was extremely idiosyncratic in the use of language. So barbaric, animalistic, these are all positive terms. And of course, mm-hmm. I mean, he knew that he was obviously being provocative, but in a way, the barbaric, archaic, animalistic Medea for him, was a, f- a form of rebellion uh, against the, the current state of affairs. Um, so this is a very good comparison, in fact. Um, and uh, brings me to another aspect of Pasolini's third world that I didn't talk about, which is the primitivist aspect in art term. That is to say, the interest of Pasolini in uh, um, artworks that, that were coming particularly from Africa and the use of uh, artifacts that we see in his films, not here, but we see them in Medea, in Arabian Nights, and so on and so forth. So there is an actual aesthetic aspect in his films, this fascination with the primitive, um, which, as, as I said, I'm not trying to defend. As I said it at the beginning, it's very easy to dismiss Pasolini as just in another white uh, um, Orientalist who was going to Africa to have sex with uh, with uh, uh, um, with kids that he had more access to than back home because he was arrested. So it's very easy. We can do that. I have no problem with it. It seems to me that there is something else, and that's what I'm trying to talk about tonight. Yeah, I think I'd have a problem with that, dismissing him entirely on that. I mean, I think we saw that in the films, that there's, there's enough other... Um, 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 aspects to the films, other kind of critical reflections 
on the society and interest in trying to understand the, um, particularly in the India film, um, many different um, structural um, factors in contributing political, cultural, caste, in, in contributing to social issues in, in the country. That's why I feel like the India film is for me somewhat the most accomplished. Absolutely. Um, but that's why there's another film that if you haven't seen, it's worth watching, which is called Notes Toward, mm -hmm. Towards an African Oresteia, in which was trying to restage uh, the Oresteia is in, uh, in, Tanz in Tanzani Tanzania, um, which is a wonderful experience. But tonight I wanted to show you how we got to that. That's why the location, in spite of mm -hmm. the quality of the copy, which wasn't that good. You see here the kind of development, how that all idea started. And then watching the location scouting in Palestine, you understand how the idea of using the notes as a form, as a genre, um, came about. Uh, by the way, the film, the book I told you about, about uh, Pasolini and death that I hope uh, was never going to be translated, it's actually upstairs on sale. It's, uh, <laughs> it's called Pasolini und Todd. So if you want to buy it, it's actually up there and, you know, send me an email and tell me that I was wrong. So. <laughs> okay, maybe um, we could see if there's some Please, questions. I, I would love to hear questions. Uh, and we have a mic here, so I come. Yes. Of any sort. The questions in French and in Italian, but not in, and in Spanish, but not in German. Sorry. I mean, in German, I could try to give a a a, a, a mark translation, which will mean slightly incorrect, but well-meaning. Oh, could you wait one second for? Thank you. Don't you think that he brought in his ideas into these foreign cultures for producing a kind of mirror for his own country or for the European countries? Yep, absolutely. Um, this is exactly what he does in Notes for an African or a State, which is trying to stage, you know, Greek tragedy in Tanzania. So yes, yeah, so the white man burdens, you know, the, his own background, his own culture, his own ideas are all there. So uh, uh, he does impose something. He goes in with a hypothesis, with the theorem, right? He goes in with a very strong vision of what things should be. What I like about the notes, as opposed to, say, Arabian Nights or Medea, which I don't find particularly interesting, is that there is an, an, a certain amount of slippage here. Because of the openness of the form, um, there is a certain amount of almost randomness or chance that is happening. So that, as you call it, strong vision is somehow less bothering, it seems to me, um, in a film, for example, that I that I profoundly dislike, like uh, like Medea or uh, or Arabian Nights, for example, which I find a kind of silly, um, this film seems to me more interesting precisely because they're not so closed as in their form. I don't know wh what was your your impression. Yeah. In my opinion, you could also see a kind of development um, also in the production quality. Yeah. Yes, in fact, that's why I wanted to show you that, that precisely that development. Also, all these, copy, all these films have been recently restored, so you can watch them on DVD in perfect uh, crystalline copy. So even location scouting in the new restored version, it looks better than the sort of white thing that you that you see here yeah you see a development and precisely it is around a time that he went to india that the idea of the film notes uh, towards a poem for the third world that is to say a general film with five episodes came about so it is at that moment the real the real he realizes that this note notes form can actually be, become something bigger we wish to tackle um bigger pro bigger problems so yeah but I sort of feel, even though I kind of like the last one somewhat better as well, but the first one is so messy, is so, you get, that's what I mentioned, the integrity. I think that one seemed like, almost like a, a, a publicity shoot for Pasolini, the concerned intellectual mm -hmm. or something. So much of it was about him um, asking questions, him 
and putting himself out there. Um, I, I don't know enough about the time to know how his references um, to the animalistic or other, mm -hmm. um, how that would be received or how that could have been contextualized. But, but I feel like the, the kind of, well, the, the complicated engagement, there, there's a self, a self awareness one could perhaps say through mm -hmm. his self insinuating his self staging of himself in, in, in yeah. making these, um, yeah. Explosive statements. Yeah, uh, this is what Ranciere says about these films. If you, if you, mm. if you like to share good company, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, exactly. This huh. uh, this idea of of the pre the physical presence of the filmmaker, like the mm -hmm. the self reflexivity of the film, but the actual the physical presence mm -hmm. of the filmmakers um, in the in the film um, that play play a key role. And uh, as I said, you know, it's very easy to dismiss these films and, uh, and uh, in many ways they are, um, they are uh, problematic. What I liked, I like to always say that I look at uh, films symptomatically in the sense of, you know, like a, like a doctor uh, looking at a patient. So in a way, symptomatically, this film seems to be very interesting precisely because of the contradiction, because they reveal everything about the period, the, the experimental moment of cinema in the 60s, the relationship with ethnography, which we haven't discussed, but of course it's very interesting. I mean, I'm sure many of you have recognized Jean Rouge influence in this film. Um, also, early television documentaries that were starting mm -hmm. to develop both in Italy and in France. Um, and also um, the fact that uh, you can see in uh, you can see by looking at Pasolini symptomatically as a symptom of his times, the fact that he was resonating with what was happening uh, in, this, in that part of the world. So mm -hmm. by looking at Pasolini in the third world, we understand a lot of what was happening in Europe, the relationship with the third world, by, as I said before, bipolarism, the fact that he was trying to escape a strongly divided bipolar world, the, the US versus Soviet divide, by entering into a discourse that at the time in Italy and elsewhere in Europe was a minority discourse, the interest in the liberation, in the liberation struggle. Yes. Um, I was asking myself, um, how was the response uh, to the, to these movies, uh, has there even been a real uh, audience? <laughs> um, because I don't know, uh, were they shown at the cinema or television? Um, I was just thinking, uh, Pasolini probably didn't uh, do that just for himself as a kind of production diary, but uh, as you uh, just said, uh, he wanted uh, to create a discussion, probably. Yes, exactly. So the first film, Location Scouting, was shown on television probably late at night once and then kind of disappeared. Ended up in a beta format in the Pasolini's archive and was finally <laughs> rediscovered years later. Um, Notes for a film on India was shown uh, at, at uh, Venice. Um, I think in front of an audience way less crowded than, than tonight and sort of disappeared uh, very quickly. Um, I can tell you that Sana did become a UNESCO uh, protected site uh, seven years later. So I don't know if that, the film was never shown anywhere. I mean, it was sent by Pasolini to UNESCO, it was actually mailed to UNESCO. Um, and they have a copy. UNESCO is in Rome, so <laughs> I guess it was a little cheaper uh, um, package. But um, so yeah, they, they, the idea was to create a debate. And, and it was also interesting that Pasolini was very critical of television, had this film produced by Italian television company Rai, and then shown in TV, precisely because he wanted to have some sort of intervention, right? Um, the debate, um, happened because uh, Pasolini was referring to them often in his uh, speeches when he was talking. It was, if you read and watch Pasolini's later on in life particularly, he was constantly referring to these films and constantly referring to the liberation struggle which became 
more important for him. Um, so uh, we we are doing some a favor, I guess, to him tonight by by sort of bringing them back. But it's a good question. Yes, a question up front. It's very re revealing for me to see that uh, Pasolini, which has a very open eye to the world, that on the on the one side, it's, and I find it very contradictory that he is on the one side very open to other people, to other countries, and on the on the on the other side, he has a very close uh, spirit of what he wants, what his uh, his ideas. Mm, it is known that uh, when he made the film or he's preparing El Vangelo Secondo Matteo, he was at the uh, when he go to Palestine, he he knew uh, uh, at this time that he will uh, uh, produce a film in Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, so he goes to Palestine to uh, to see what he knows in the head really before, know, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a condemnation of Palestine. The mm -hmm. condemnation is a central. Uh, 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 for for pa Pasolini, and that's very revealing for me. That uh, on the un on the one uh, on the one side, he's very open. The film as a written language of a reality, and on the other side, he's an author, a classical European author, which has his own thoughts with a very close view on the yeah. on, on this reality. And this is uh, for me um, a, a great contradiction. Is it for you? Oh, absolutely. And so you agree with the, with the other speaker before? Absolutely. And what you just said is kind of interesting. He knew that he had already found the location in Matera, but he decided to go anywhere. The justification, it's in the movie. Remember, he says you have to walk where Jesus walks so you can actually see. But um, I think you, you, you put it perfectly. I mean, Pasolini is, on the one hand, the ultimate auteur in the European sense. He's, he's a modernist auteur, very much... Um, in line with uh, the other author of the time. Yeah, absolutely. And on the other, there's exactly this aspect, and that's why I think it's interesting. Because you know, when it when uh, when when people criticize Pasolini for this Orientalist uh, racist comments, my, my answer is usually, where, where where were the others? What were the others doing? You know what I'm saying? So the it's that openness that that sits there that complicates, and I think enriches his filmography, um, his films in particular, more than his poetry, more than his novels. I think that this openness to the world, what he calls the discovery of the elsewhere, La, la Scoperta dell'Altrove, it's very interesting because it is the location that all of a sudden speaks to him and, and brings him to make um, a different film. If you think of, I don't know if you guys have seen, I'm sure you've seen the, the trilogy, right? Uh, the Cameron, which I... Fi don't find particularly exciting as films, but what's interesting about it is the use of locations that he makes in this film, the the Cameron episode in Naples and so on and so forth. So there is that openness that other authors didn't have. Fellini was, just to go back, you know, Fellini was a clo closed structure, right? There's nothing outside of the auteur, and I'm sure we can think of many others that are like that. In Fellini, there is this uh, discovery of the elsewhere, and there is the political aspect, the fact that there was a political commitment to liberation struggle that he embraced from the very beginning. He read Fanon immediately, Tr Fanon was translated, uh, and so was his son. They were all translated in Italy immediately, and he was an avid reader and spoke often. Pasolini, about, uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, Pasolini. So this is an interesting aspect that we don't see in other filmmakers of the time. A follow-up comment? I, I think uh, Pasolini is a very typical type of agrarian, agrarian intellectual, you know? Agrarian, like yeah, from yeah. the countryside? It's, it's not a word from me, it's from Carsten Witte and Gerd Martenglott. You have a, 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 a long ago a speech about that, uh, and I think that's very typical for him. I think it's a very good uh, connotation for him. Sure. Um, well, Pasolini was coming from a, a noble family, believe it or not. They were from Bologna, and uh, he, he lived most of his life in Friuli because of the war. Um, so I don't know if I, 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 I'm trying to think if 
I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure it, it's it add an interesting aspect to to Pasolini. I think it was, you know, the a, a, you know European '60s intellectuals in many respects. Uh, anyway, I'll think about it. Are there any final comments? Yes, Nora. I guess I get there quicker. Um, in Il Vangelo secondo Matteo, I I, uh, I noticed the faces of the people. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a face person. I always watch faces, and I'm interested in ph physiognomy. And I have the feeling he is he is too. Yes. Because. I have the feeling he's he looked at different pictures from like Grunewald 1500 or at flagellation pictures where you see these bad people with the crooked noses yeah. without the yeah. teeth that look very yeah. with their sexy butts out and yeah. with their faces very erotic and ugly at the same time. Mm -hmm. I've seen many apostles that have these kind of faces and also racism, yes or no, whatever. I think I like him, but maybe he's a little bit narrow minded. But he, I, I have the feeling he's interested in la physionomia yep. because he's asking the woman in this Indian film, the last film, what does a pariah look like? Mm -hmm. how, mm -hmm. how do you, how, how, how does yeah. real Jew look like? Whatever. Yeah, yeah. He's, he, he's like, yeah. he has a kind of, yeah. did, in his writings, does he say anything about that, yeah. about faces, about how a certain person sh should look or whatever? Yeah. So it was very interesting in in faces, particularly because um, he truly believed that the that modernity, and by modernity he meant uh, industrialization, the media had actually changed people's physiognomy. He called it the anthropological mutation of Italians. He claimed that you can tell the the face, the difference in the face from somebody who grew up before and after television. <laughs> Before and after modernization, industrialization, um, he's, he's he's trying to find what he calls archaic faces, and, and he's obsessed by that. Going back to the other question about uh, the, the question about imposing a vision, um, he was a student of art history, uh, and um, he uh, wrote uh, wrote his first thesis, which he lost during the war while he was trying to escape in 1945, um, on. Um, the realist, uh, the realist of the Italian 16th and 17th century. So he was obsessed by faces specifically. So it's kind of interesting because in the Vangelo we see on the one hand this almost anthropological interest in different faces and how different um, heritages, heritages of people have affected their faces, whether they were from the north, from the south, from Africa. And on the other, we see art history. We see basically a, a replica of, uh, of Pontormo, Rosso Fiorentino, of Caravaggio, of all the painters that were part of his makeup. Um, a scholar once said that he believes that Pasolini's films are an attempt at replicating the slides, the black and white slides that Longhi, who was his professor in Bologna, uh, had during his classes, and that he was so struck, he calls it the artistic, f f f f I can say it, anyway, uh, he was so struck by these classes taught by Longhi in, in Bologna, and at the time there wasn't the possibility of having color slides, so there were black and white slides reproduction, that all his filmography can be brought back to the classes he took in art history uh, in Bologna. And we see both, and they both coexist at exactly the same time, the anthropological vein and the vision that he had already. You guys are good. Um, I don't know how long I can hold off. Go ahead. Okay. Would you agree with me that, uh, coming back to the faces issue, that Pasolini is really fa focused on physiognomics, not so much on what Lichtenberg has called patho pathognomics, or the theater movement in the faces. And um, that was particularly clear also in most of the scenes. Sometimes you had a smiling boy, fine, but that's about it. But in most of his movies, I know it's always like a dead face and um, it's sort of strange in s if somebody believes in sort of revolutions and so on movement it's, it's strange you know how he fixes that that's for me a big contradiction you know that's like a closed structure that is not so to speak open yeah. so when he was shooting uh, when he was shooting uh, Mam Mama Roma which is his second film there's a beautiful picture of him with a painting by Pontormo 
and next to the cameraman and trying to reproduce the painting right and so particularly because he loved to use zoom lenses for close-ups that had a very flattening effect we don't see this here because these are very rough films so they're all handheld ariflex um, 8 16 millimeters but in the films you really see that the flattening of the face he really wanted to recreate a, a portrait, a, 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 a renaissance, a rena or even later, actually, a realist, uh, realist portrait. So he's not interested in movement because there is no movement in paintings. He's, he's, he's trying to impose his own vision on the one hand and trying to look at uh, the people in front of him in the streets in, in Rome, at, at least at the beginning of his career. Um, if you come for the Arabian Nights, uh, you can also see his attempt, unless you guys screen it already. No, we didn't. It, it's coming. In uh, We are showing Arabian Nights. I'm out of or you yeah, can, in, the, a, in the spring. You can see also an attempt and Pasolini of reproducing known, uh, uh, um, known perspectival paintings, particularly in the, in the scene with the uh, when Nineto is having uh, sex with the with that bow and arrow, um, uh, he, that's a clear attempt at reproducing a known 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 perspectival um, representation, which he believed was somehow at the core of non-Western art. So he was very aware of representational issues, but this is all another issue. So, mm -hmm. it's very interesting because you know once you start going in, you never come out. <laughs> I think maybe. Just you should know. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. What, uh, let them let them ask a question. Oh, was there another question? I'm sorry. Yes, Regina Pranger. As you refer to art history, I have to <laughs> say something uh, about Polaiuolo, who's yeah. mentioned in the, oh, yeah. in the right. first film. And uh, if I remember well, he says that he feels a, f a shame because of the, the the landscape is so poor and yeah. so. Uh, little so uh, he's ashamed because no polaiolo had to invent it yes. instead he could mm -hmm. be there he's ashamed because yeah. polaiolo couldn't go and he could and pasolini could <laughs> yes but but uh, in his in in his film uh, sopra sopra, sopra Luoghi, he yeah. uh, he always um, uh, is describing the landscape as as not 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 he, he uh, the landscape lacks sublimity, yeah, and yeah. I, I would Lacks like to. Sublime, I, yeah. I would like to ask you, what would, how would you see the relationship between this film, this documentary film, this Sopra Luoghi, and the final film, the uh, Il Vangelo Secondo Matteo, that, because there he realizes this sublimity, the closeness, the yeah. pathos, all these grandezza he misses in. In the real Palestina. Yeah, and yet that so film is probably the most cinema verite of all his films. It's full of zooms, full of uh, mobile cameras. Is the more is the more active of all his films in a, in a funny way. Um, I think that the idea was that uh, he wanted to give back to the gospel that grandiosity that he hoped. Once again, going back to the idea, he really wanted this to be big, right? And he says so. And he says, I cannot get it big enough here. So I'm gonna get it as big as I can in uh, in my own shooting. Um, you know that that location in Matera where Pasolini shot the gospel was also used by um, what's his name, Mel Gibson. Thank you. Uh, the, what is it called? The, the stupidity of um, <laughs> what is it called? What was it? Passion of the passion of Christ. Oh yeah, the passion so of Christ. Yeah. I, if you have time, I recommend you watch it after Pasolini. Just to give you an idea, think about the reaction of the, the French intelligentsia to the mm -hmm. Algerian crisis. I mean, apart from Sartre and very few other, the large majority mm -hmm. of the French intelligentsia was behind the uh, civiliza civil le, le fort de civilisatrice, right? The civil civilizing effort. So. Um, I think it's fine. We can. I, I yeah. don't think Pasolini. I think Pasolini himself wouldn't mind being called I'm racist. Sure he in wouldn't, fact, he yeah. would relish in, in that idea. What we don't find is Pasolini. If by racist we mean somebody who judges people, prejudges people based on their own race, we never see that in Pasolini. We see an interest mm -hmm. in finding. Mm -hmm faces that he believe were representative of something, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. there is no pre pre 
precondition uh, yeah, on it. Yeah. Um, in fact, and as I said, um, if you, if you think as modernity as evil, as you can see very clearly in this in these films, right? Uh, the idea of being barbaric or being pre-modern is a, is a complementary, right? Somebody who mm -hmm. hasn't been ruined by modernization, which it's a problematic idea, of course, and f fully, I mean, in, in many respects, extremely orientalist. Um, and yet he tackles it head on. So what you see is what you get. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. you can really see his thinking in as as he does that. Um, do, I don't know if you do. You guys does anybody teach Pasolini, or in class? No, you're none of your teachers. Okay, I was going <laughs> to give you advice, but yeah, like don't show these films, for example, because they're very complicated. They're well, funny enough. They generate a lot. Lots of people, rightly so, get offended. They're not. They don't speak to our own sensibility. That's that's very clear. They probably didn't speak to the sensibility of the time either. Mm -hmm. But at the time, they were read in a certain way that we don't see. We don't see now. What did you guys think of the kibbutz scene? Wasn't that weird? <laughs> All of a sudden, we we're talking about the kibbutz and socialism and you know Israeli. Beef pre Netanyahu <laughs> Israel. So it's kind of an interesting moment, even historically, right? Mm -hmm. Finding these Italian Jews who had moved to Israel and lived in the kibbutz. Uh, kind of a powerful scene, I think, on education of children. But I actually think that one should show these films and discuss them because I think they really do offer us um, uh, kind of, they, if one works through, we don't have time to do it now, but and, and you gave us some of the tools to do that in the discussion, pursue them. But I think that they're, they're working through a way they can have and can even be helpful today trying to think through, um, you know, murderous fundamentalisms and murderous liberalism and, and trying to come up with new approaches to these discussions. I don't know. I think that I, I think in North America, I probably I wouldn't teach it in the States because it because <laughs> Um, because of the um, the insanity of these kind of triggering debates that go on there, but um, but in Germany you could do it. <laughs> is, a, is a romantic uh, idealist. Uh, I believe in this the German state. Yes. Uh, oh, I don't. I'm I don't. Kidding you. I was trying to. I was trying to frame you. Okay, that's fine. Use me. Um, okay. Well, um, we should perhaps come to a close. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Luca. Thank you. Thank you very much also. And um, I'm easy to find. I'm, I'm the only Luca at Concordia University. So if you want to send me an email or if you have any questions, I would be happy to respond to your emails. And in um, two weeks, um, your friend and colleague who you praised and and possibly criticized avant la lettre. Um, uh, yeah. We'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> Tom um, Thomas Waugh, um, which um, is something not to miss. Tom is a great speaker, and that would be a wonderful event. That's in two weeks, where he's showing Teorema. Yep. Great. Thank you all. Thanks again, Luca. Coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe we should start. This.